As we approach our week of prayer, I'd like to share one of the worst kept secrets in the church. Not many believers actually like praying. We love the idea of intimacy with an all-powerful God predisposed to grant our every whim. But none of us want to do the grunt work when we're tired, heartbroken, or even just bored with a deity who seems to be deaf to the deepest cries of our souls. I know I go through drought seasons during my prayer life, and I'm praying for the Holy Spirit's strength and inspiration for when I find daily prayer hard. And I suspect I'm not the only Christian who struggles. But we cannot truly build a relationship with God or partner with him to shape the course of history without prayer. It's the very breath of the soul. As I've been preparing for this sermon, I've sensed from the Holy Spirit that he wants to revive stagnating prayer lives like mine. And he's led me back to the best and most beautiful prayer template in the Bible, the Lord's Prayer, or as we should call it, the Disciples' Prayer. We need to go back to basics and build upon the perfect foundations Jesus gave us in Matthew 6 and Luke 11. And we'll be alternating between these two passages throughout the sermon. In Luke 11, the passage begins with, one day Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. We should all have the same desire as the first disciples, to learn from Jesus how he prayed on earth and continues to intercede for us in heaven. So let's set aside some of our daily prayer time to simply ask, Lord Jesus, teach me to pray like you. Let's take a look at the disciples' prayer in Matthew 6. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. As we move through this template, I've broken it down into sections and by divine inspiration, they all begin with P. So we start with perspective. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. So often when we approach God's throne in prayer, it's simply to chuck our wish and want list at his feet and then dash into the busy mundanities of our days. Is it any wonder that our prayer lives are so half-hearted and watered down when we start from this self-absorbed perspective of our own needs rather than God's majesty. How we approach him in prayer largely depends on what we know him to be like. That's why it is so important to begin our prayers with adoration, to readjust and expand our views of God. The descriptions of God we find in the Bible, particularly the Psalms, are wonderful sources of inspiration to shape our adoration of him. Let's look at a description of him in Revelation 4. John writes, At once I was in the Spirit, and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of jasper and ruby, a rainbow that shone like an emerald encircled the throne. Surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones, and seated on them were 24 elders. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings and peals of thunder, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever and say, you are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honour and power. For you created all things and by your will they were created and have their being. Now try and squeeze God into our cramped little frames of doubt, apathy and disappointment. He is the one who created the dizzying heights of the Himalayas, the thundering roar of Niagara Falls, the shimmering sands of the Sahara Deserts, and the vibrant cacophonies of the Amazonian rainforest. And he created them all simply through his words. That's how powerful the voice of God is. Scientists estimate that our universe contains one septillion stars. Our Milky Way alone contains over a hundred billion of them and God has named each and every one. That's how vast and brilliant his mind is. The very atoms of the chair you're sitting on, the molecules of your breath going in and out 20,000 times a day, the 46 miles of nerves, 
within you processing and absorbing this information. All of it is sustained by Jesus, as we're taught in Hebrews 1, by his powerful word, and he doesn't even break a sweat. That's how mighty he is. And yet, God also yearns for us to call him Father. And the word that Jesus uses is Abba, closer to Daddy or Papa. Like Esther trembling before King Xerxes, we wonder if we dare approach such a powerful being only to find that his scepter of favour is always extended towards us. That he, like the father of the prodigal son, scans the horizon for sight of us, stoops down from his glorious throne to listen to our fumbling prayers in crude human languages which can never do his holiness justice, and yet such prayers delight his heart. When we declare our father, not my father, we are reminding ourselves of our true identities as believers, sons and daughters of the Most High God, and our relationship to one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. The first disciples probably gasped when they were invited to call Yahweh, the Holy One of Israel, our Father, but we treat this phrase all too cheaply. We want intimacy with Daddy God, but wriggle uncomfortably away from the idea of revering him as holy. Has over-familiarity with God's grace, abundant love and mercy created a casual attitude in us towards his purity? If Christians don't treat his name as holy, how can we expect non-believers to respect it? It's only by the blood of Jesus that we even dare approach his throne, surprised time and time again that he lovingly raises us to our feet, invites us to call him Abba, and graciously inclines his perfect ears towards our imperfect prayers. That is why it is so important to begin our daily prayers by worshipping God, by hallowing his name, just a fancy way of saying, Father, may you be treated with the respect and honour that your holiness demands. Because it is this heavenly lens that then fuels the rest of our prayers. All our intercessions, petitions and confessions. Adoration keeps us going. And it's not for God's benefit. He's not some vain puppeteer who enjoys standing ovations. It's for our benefit to build our faith, alter our perspectives. Help us to turn from the small, impotent idols of the world towards someone infinitely greater and intimately knowable. And so, with our perspective of the God we serve expanded and our faith strengthened, we move on to the next section. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. When we pray, we focus all too quickly on our own concerns. But in Jesus' prayer template, he focuses first on the person of God before the people of God. And so we learn to prioritise the concerns of God's kingdom and his will. This learning curve takes a lifetime. But if we ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to us how and what to pray for his kingdom and his will in situations, we'll be surprised at where he leads us and rejoice as we align ourselves with his purposes and watch unyielding doors swing open. But persistent prayer can be unglamorous, repetitive and ongoing. Often it can seem like nothing's happening, the odds are too great, the suffering too much, and our prayers of intercession die on the tips of our tongues without the adoration that precedes it or the power of the Holy Spirit to continue to refill us when we're just running on fumes. Why is it so hard? Because it's how we enter into the suffering of Christ. As head of the church, he suffers with every one of the believers who make up the church. And as we mature in our faith, so we realise that following Jesus doesn't just bring rights and privileges, it also brings responsibilities. Responsibilities to come alongside fellow believers like Aaron and her lifting up Moses' exhausted arms in prayer so that victory would come to Joshua on the battlefield below. There is a potency to our prayers as we come together, as we will this week, to seek God's will and to build his kingdom. And when we do, we see breakthrough and transformation begin to happen. Let's remind ourselves that God is spirit. He isn't shackled to a physical body, locked in one time and location. He can answer any prayer in any place. He saunters down corridors of power and presides over war councils. He smashes through enemy lines and strides into sick rooms. All in response to our persistent prayers without taking away the gift of free will, but influencing, convicting and appealing to people's hearts. 
By persisting in this way, we can partner with him in the shaping of history. It's an incredible privilege that he allows himself to be moved by our petitions. My sense as I've been preparing this sermon is that he's telling us to keep going, keep going with intercessory prayer, to persist in it at all costs, especially for the coming week. The most powerful and loving act we can do for another human being is to persist in prayer for them. So let's not give up or grow impatient when our prayers for situations, loved ones and enemies aren't answered immediately. God cannot be rushed. He's never in a hurry. His timing is perfect in a way that we, in our fallibility, cannot truly understand. But there's an old saying, God has two timings, slowly and suddenly. And often when we look back, we see that what seemed to happen suddenly was actually the groundbreaking work of persistent kingdom bringing prayer long before the harvest. From praising God to persistently praying for his kingdom, we now come to petitioning our heavenly father for our own needs, give us our daily bread. As God fed the Israelites in the wilderness with daily manna in order to teach them humble reliance on him, so we also need to bring our daily needs to him and recognize him as our provider in times of famine and feast, unemployment and promotion, war and peace, pandemic and aftermath. This is a challenge to our individualism in the proud, self-reliant West. But this humble posture of daily reliance and gratitude towards God transforms our perspective both of him and ourselves. And yet such is the generous heart of God that he so often supplies us with above and beyond our needs. Ephesians 3 assures us that he is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. Amazingly, God is just as interested in the granular little details of our lives as we are and carries our big hopes and dreams close to his heart. In Luke 11, after Jesus has set out his prayer template, he goes on to tell his disciples, Suppose you have a friend and you go to him at midnight and say, friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me and I have no food to offer him. And suppose the one inside answers, don't bother me. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he won't get up and give you the bread because of friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. So I say to you, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. So often when we approach God with our needs and wants, we imagine him as that surly neighbor and so feebly tap against the doors of heaven's storehouses without making so much as a dent. Yet these verses, Jesus shows us how much bold faith-filled, audacious prayers move the heart of our generous Father who is already predisposed to look on us with favour. Have we forgotten that the cattle on a thousand hills are his? So let's be bold and specific with our petitions, as the Greek used for knock and the door will be opened, kruo, implies to keep on knocking. It's continuous, humble and audacious at the same time. Let's also hold this intention with the fact that God is not a genie who grants our every wish and whim. He's our good father, and no wise parent gives their child everything they've asked for. As God transforms our perspectives of himself, so he transforms our wants and desires too, so that even they center around him. Often, it's in seasons of waiting for something we've petitioned God for a long time, that he performs the greatest spiritual heart surgery. Our circumstances may not have changed, but we have. Another way God transforms our perspective of who he is and who we are is through regular repentance and forgiveness. It's a really tough area of prayer to put into practice, but it is essential. Forgive us our sins, for we have also forgiven everyone who sins against us. Through adoration and worship, the spirit convicts us of our unworthiness before the King of Kings. There is no room for pride before his throne. Intercession and petition likewise remind us how helpless we are. And so we arrive at confession, potentially our least favorite area of prayer. But God can only do so much with hard hearts that say no to his spirit's purifying touch. 
Clenched fists need to become open palms in order to receive and give grace. As Pete Gregg puts it, sadly we've all met enough cantankerous old Christians to realise there is nothing inevitable about sanctification. Regular confession is like digging a well. The more dirt and debris that is cleared, the purer the water will be. So, the more we allow the Holy Spirit to gently and powerfully excavate the dark, muddy recesses of our hearts, the more healing and wholeness can come, the more we become like Jesus. When we confess our sins, we're not shocking God with something he doesn't already know, but unconfessed sin creates distance between us and our Heavenly Father, but repentance forms a bridge into his presence. The wonderful truth is we can't outrun his love and his grace is the only thing powerful enough to change us. Yet penitence is twofold. Notice the challenge in the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us. Ah. As Jesus says in Matthew 6, for if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Jesus teaches us to forgive others as we are forgiven. In other words, if we forgive others only a little and hold grudges, we're asking God to only forgive us a little and hold grudges against us. Ouch. I once heard it said that unforgiveness is like carrying a corpse on our backs. The longer we carry it, the heavier it gets, the more it rots, the more it infects us, the greater we suffer. Yet sometimes the wounds are so deep, the trauma is so great, we really struggle to forgive. That's when we need to call upon the Holy Spirit to step in, to help us forgive the seemingly unforgivable, to bring greater freedom and healing. Total forgiveness may mean walking away from a relationship or situation, seeking counselling or even going to the police, but it is the choice to lovingly let go rather than to hatefully hold on. When we choose to forgive others, we are choosing to partner with Jesus in his ongoing restoration work, to restore his creation, reconcile his church, and how we forgive is genuinely one of our most powerful forms of witness to a damaged and outraged world, particularly in the age of cancel culture. Penitent forgiving hearts are part of how we help build God's upside down kingdom and enact his outrageously gracious will here on earth as it is in heaven. As we mature in our prayer life as believers, so we discover that there are three involved in our prayers. Our almighty God who hears and answers our prayers, us as the praying believer, and the enemy who combats our prayers. The purpose of our prayers, therefore, is not to try and manipulate or influence God, but to join forces with him against the enemy. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. This is another reason why we as Christians find prayer so hard. Did you know Satan trembles when we pray? He'll do anything to distract us from praying, and our 24-7 culture of digital opiates sedates and blinds us to his schemes. Satan isn't threatened by prayer in theory, but prayer in practice terrifies him. Because alongside the word of God, it is the most powerful spiritual weapon we have. We do this when we adore God above the gaudy idols the devil flings in our way. We do this when we persistently intercede for God's kingdom and his will to smash through satanic strongholds. We do this when we petition God as our source of fulfillment instead of relying on ourselves or others. And we do this when we penitently confess our sins regularly to our gracious saviour and freely forgive others in order to deny the devil even so much as a foothold. So let's build daily prayers of protection over situations, nations, others and ourselves, asking God for a deeper revelation that the one who is in us is greater than the one who is in the world. We stand in the victory that stems from the foot of the cross all the way down to the gates of hell where we are called to join the fight. But the enemy is a sore loser and he will try to take as many down with him as he can before he is forced to accept defeat. Just as Moses kept his hands lifted over the battlefield, so we must keep partnering with Jesus to lift the victory of the cross until each battle is won, until evil forces retreat and are vanquished. It is important to note that as we pray, lead us not into temptation, that God doesn't lead us into temptation. 
God doesn't tempt us, but he does test us, stretch us, and in his faithfulness always provides a getaway vehicle from temptation. But this part of Jesus' prayer template reminds us to ask for the way out and the strength and courage to take it. And we have this wonderful promise from 1 Corinthians 10. God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. This part of the prayer template teaches us how important it is to stop flirting with sin, but to actively flee and resist it. In other words, don't lead us into places where we can be tempted, but lead us into places where you are and where we can be free. Praise is also one of our greatest spiritual weapons, and some later manuscripts of the disciples' prayer in Matthew 6 add an additional line after the prompt to pray for protection. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. This section is known as the doxology, a short hymn of praise, and was added as the early church adapted their liturgy around the Lord's Prayer. Praise is a fitting way to end our daily prayers. It brings everything full circle, back to adoration, back to recentering our focus on God. It's the crescendo which helps strengthen our faith and end our prayers on a high note. So, we've broken down the template of the Lord's Prayer as a perfect source for our daily prayers, and there are plenty of other wonderful prayer templates in the Bible for us to use. But pep talks, podcasts, and books about prayer will only get us so far. What do we do when the motivation to hit the snooze button is stronger than our urge to meet with our heavenly Abba? We keep going. I'd like to end with some practical tips because it's crucial to pray daily. If this is not part of your daily routine already, don't start by setting yourself impossible targets like deciding to get up every morning at 4 a.m. and pray for an hour. Remember to keep it simple, keep it real and keep it up. Ease yourself in and create manageable habits that you can build upon. This can be as simple as deciding to get up five minutes earlier or setting reminders on your phone to pray at different times in the day and for different subject areas such as the salvation of loved ones or reading a psalm aloud in adoration or downloading the Lectio 365 app or like Jesus, finding a certain place where you can go and pray undisturbed. And when all that gets comfortable, easy and boring, go back to adoration and add an extra five minutes. First thing in the morning is a great time to pray. The day is uncluttered by demands and so it's the opportune time to stretch it out before God. Seek his perspective, kingdom and will for the day's opportunities and difficulties. If you struggle first thing in the morning, don't pray in bed, get up and wake up. A splash of cold water in the face, a mug of coffee beside your Bible, a really hard chair, and praying aloud are great ways to stop yourself from daydreaming and drifting. The evening is another great time to pray, to reflect on the day, praising God for his many mercies and provisions and allowing his spirit to challenge and convict us where we've sinned so that we can confess it quickly and ask Jesus to help us to do better tomorrow, to apologize to someone if needs be and make amends. But the most important thing is to prioritize prayer. We all tend to excuse ourselves from prayer by claiming there's not enough time in the day. But the more we repeat it, so we come to believe it. And Satan sighs with relief. We all have 24 hours in a day, but not everyone has the same capacity and that is okay. But limited capacity can still produce deep faithfulness and persistence in prayer. Susanna Wesley, often referred to as the mother of the Methodist church, had 19 children. Her house burnt down twice, and her husband was largely absent. And yet, her many children knew that when she had her apron up over her head, even for just a few minutes, they were not to disturb her. She was praying. Daniel in the Bible, prime minister to a vast empire, still found time to pray three times a day, even on pain of death. And Jesus prioritised daily prayer and none of our earthly work will ever be as important as his. When I'm challenged by these examples, I wonder, what is my excuse? We are not responsible for our capacity, but we are responsible for how we invest our time. If we value prayer as a highest priority, we will arrange our day around it. Not in a religious duty kind of way, where we end up resenting God for the spiritual checklist we think he set us but out of a desire for relationship with him, 
He won't, he can't love us any less if we don't pray regularly, but we will love him less. The more time we spend talking and listening to him, the more we get to know him, the more we become like Jesus. And it is intimacy with God, which is the bedrock of our prayer lives during dry and dusty seasons, times of grief and heartache, and is the greatest sign of our growing spiritual maturity. There's an old saying, the kingdom of heaven advances on its knees. It's a position of constant humility, adoring before our heavenly father's throne, reliant on him to meet our daily needs and forgive our sins. But it's also a position of defiant resistance and strength against all the darkness, suffering and selfishness in the world. A movement to bring Jesus' kingdom and will into those places and see them transformed. But we cannot achieve this unless we allow Jesus to transform our prayer lives first. As we've broken down the six different areas of the disciples' prayer, perspective, persistence, petition, penitence, protection, and praise, I wonder which one has challenged you the most? Where do you need the help of the Holy Spirit to revive or build your prayer life? Wherever you are, please join me in saying the disciples' prayer aloud and ask the Holy Spirit to highlight an area where he wants you to grow in and prioritise it during your daily prayers over the coming week. I hope you'll be challenged and blessed at what he's revealed to you by the end of it. So together we say this contemporary version of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen.